What a good day already. It has been so much fun. I am so excited to bring today's message. I can't even... I can't even describe it to you. I'm so fired up for today. But before I get too ahead of myself, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves. You are amazing people. You really are amazing people chasing after God, hungry for the things of the Lord. And I am so excited to be just a part of this family, honestly. We have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Emphasis on the lifelong and followers of Jesus. Emphasis on the whole thing. It's just all good. If you grabbed a bulletin today, it's a great time to take it out. Um, and so you can take some notes with us. There's a lot of scriptures and notes today, baby. I'm just telling you, it's going to be it's gonna be a big one. Or you could get on the YouVersion Bible app. Um, there should be a code right there. That's, that's it right there. It's probably the most famous Bible app there is, the most popular one, the best one, I believe. You can download it by clicking that link right there. And you can also make it your home church. You can say, where's your home church? Lifeline Church. You'll see our little L logo. Boom. And then you'll get updates from us too. It's really exciting. It's exciting to me anyways. I like stuff like that. I don't know if you think that's exciting or not, but you can do it. And you can see all of our notes, all the scriptures for today's service in that app, in your Bible reading app. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, we started a series last week called Closer, as you could tell by that awesome video. It's like got me fired up, got me fired up watching it. Um, and we started it last week. It's a series about worship, it's a series about worship. And, uh, and when we think of worship, we tend to think of these formal settings. We, we, think of, we think of songs. We think of, you know, coming to a service like this one. Maybe you think of more traditional settings where worship is going to a place and doing a thing. Um, and it, it is that, but it's also so much more than that. Worship is so much bigger than that, and I want to take the next few weeks unpacking what it really is. Last week, we talked all about that we all worship something. We were made for it. We were made to worship something. There's always going to be a spot in our heart that needs to, to be filled by something, and that, that one thing is God, of course. But we were made to worship, and, and, and worship is essentially love expressed. When I'm expressing love, that is an act of worship. So we're expressing love to God. That is, a, that is an act of worship to him. Today, today, today. Um, I, you're going to see me the most geeked out that you've ever seen me. And probably this is the most geeky message I'm going to bring all year long. I'm absolutely fired up about it. And just a disclaimer of sorts, I'm not, I didn't come up with all this stuff. Like pastors have preached this content, this, this kind of message that I'm about to bring you. Uh, Pastor Robert Morris has preached this, Pastor Chris Hodges. I'm going to bring it to you in my own way, of course. But this concept, I didn't come up with this. Like this is really deep, really wonderful uh, the uh, theology that's going to um, just, I think, I believe it's going to encourage you. It's going to equip you. Um, but I didn't come up with it, but I did. I, I learned it very early on. And I'm going to bring it to you in a way that Lifeline would understand, I hope. I hope. Um, so let's, let's just jump right in. The first question I want to bring to you is, who was the first worship leader? Who was the first worshiper? The first worshiper that ever existed. And to find the answer to this question, you've got to go to the first mention of something. It's, it's called the law of first mention. In your Bible, if you want to get the purest teaching of something, you've got to go where it was first mentioned. It's called the law of first mention. For all of you um, Bible students, all of you uh, people who went through Bible college, you had to memorize that. So that's most of you. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> and just to kind of take the mystery out of it, um, it was Lucifer. Lucifer, the devil. Uh, maybe you've heard that in stories. You didn't know if it was true. I'm going, to, I'm going to prove it to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the first worshiper, the first worship leader, the devil, Satan, otherwise known as Lucifer, was the first worshiper. And this is important to us. If we're going to understand what worship is and how to, how to do it right, we got to understand how... He, how kind of he was built. There was three named angels in the Bible. See, they were getting geeky already. I love this stuff so much. I hope you do too. But there was three named angels in the Bible. Just three. Just three. Uh, there was Michael, was a named angel. And we, we see him in the uh, book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, when Daniel's praying around the middle of Daniel. Um, you could read the whole, the whole book of Daniel in like 35 minutes. So I encourage you to go do that. It's really an exciting book to read. But Michael shows up in response to prayer. That's important. That 
when we see Michael in the Bible and we see him active, he's usually responding to a prayer or active because of prayer. And in Daniel, he said, the moment you started praying, boom, here we go. And, and things are happening. So what you need to know is when you pray, angels go, oh, that's a good thing right there. Let's go. When you pray, the heavenlies are moved when you pray. So praying is important. Don't forget to do it. But he's the first name angel I want to tell you about. The second one is Gabriel. Anybody who's been to church on Christmas knows Gabriel because he was the one that delivered the word to Mary. And that's where we normally see Gabriel delivering a word, like the message of God, bringing a decree. So we have Michael who's involved with prayer. We have um, uh, Gabriel who is involved with the word. And then we have Lucifer. And I will show you beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was engaged in worship. That was his job. That was his function. I don't know how else to say it, but that's what it was. So there's three named angels. So all three of these categories, prayer, the word, and worship, like this represents all of heaven, I would imagine, because there's three named angels. And even as we're going to talk about in, in the future in Revelation 12, that when, when, when Lucifer fell from heaven, he swept one third of the angels from heaven. I'll, I'll show you later. But he swept one third of the stars of the sky down there. So I would imagine that it's like this three-part category of the word, worship, and prayer. I mean, that's why we talk about the first 15 when, when, when we describe like what a good devotional should be like in your life. We always say if you're starting out, spend five minutes in worship, five minutes in prayer, and, and five minutes in your word at least, right? And that, that encompasses the fullness of of what the spiritual world basically has to offer, so to speak, that they live in these three categories. And so in case you're taking notes and you want to jot this down, Revelation 12, 4 uh, speaks of a, of a great red dragon in the sky that swept his tail and, and brought one third of the angels. So I would just have to imagine that all the angels, including the named angels, one third, one third, one third, our spiritual life exists in, in, in uh, those three categories. Now, this following passage I'm going to show you in Isaiah is, is all about, if you were just reading it through in your devotionals, it would say the king of Babylon, the king of Babylon. And you're like, all right, this, this, is, a, this is like slamming a human being. But I want to tell you, no, that's not the fullness of this passage because even Jesus himself said to Peter, he said, get behind me, Satan. When Peter recommended that, hey, you should give yourself glory, whatever, he, Jesus behind me Satan. Well, Peter wasn't Satan himself, but oftentimes in scripture, we'll see, we'll see uh, uh, spoken to the spirit behind the thing. So there's a spirit behind the thing. And in this passage, I'll show you beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not talking to the king of, of Babylon. It's actually talking to Satan. It's talking to Lucifer. Um, and, you know, just go back and go back in the gospels. You'll see that yourself. But in Isaiah 14, watch this. So exciting. How you have fallen from heaven a morning star. So that, you, you know it's not the king of Babylon because he didn't fall from heaven. Obviously, this is talking about someone else, okay? It's talking about Lucifer. How you fall from heaven, morning star, and there it is again, the star, because that's how, that's just how angels and, and was, was referenced in the Bible many, many times. Morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Satan was an angel in heaven who got expelled um, between, and Many scholars believe this, and I, I tend to believe it too, that this event that he was cast down happened in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Are you guys excited about this as I am? I'm so mm, loving this so much. But think about it. Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. Ah, oh, It's like this glorious. And then the very next verse is the earth was formless, void, darkness covered the, the earth. You know, it's like, it, like if you just read it again, you see that it takes a turn. Now, there's no way for me to prove this, but many theologians believe, and I tend to as well, that it happened in between. So obviously, Satan had to be created. Satan's a created being, just like all the other angels, all right? God is different. God is the creator. Everything else is created. So Satan was created in verse 1-1, and then somewhere in the, in the middle of that, he was cast down to the earth, and now is in operation here on earth, okay? And that happened in between verse 1-1 and 1-2, and Okay? He, he was cast down and the earth was void, but why? Why was he expelled? That's probably your next question. It says so right here, verse 13. You said in your heart, and this is speaking about Lucifer, and watch all these words I highlighted. 
I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mountain assembly, on the utmost heights of the mountain of Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high. That boy wanted to be up. I don't know what his deal was, but he just loved up. I'm too low, want to be high. I believe pride is the original sin. I, I, this is an Eliotism. This is not from anybody else's teaching. This is my thought. I, 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 I struggle with it because I can't prove it necessarily, but I just believe, and you can take it for what it's worth, I believe all of our sin is rooted in pride. It protects me. It makes me feel good. You know, sin does feel good for a season until it kills you, <laughs> until it doesn't make you feel good, right? So I believe all of our sin kind of resides in, in pride. That's why God is so thick uh, through the whole Bible on humility and pride. Like if you're humble, you're just going to win. You're going to end up winning. You're going to end up doing well in life. The humble will be exalted, but those who exalt themselves will be, will be humbled. The pride will be, their pride will, will bring them down. And that's exactly what happened to Lucifer. Pride I believe, is the original sin. Satan's goal, then, is to redirect any and all attention that goes to God and not just bring it to himself, but direct it anywhere else because that would be a victory for him. If I, if, so Lucifer is sitting back, maybe. You just picture it like this. If he can get anyone's eyes off of God onto anything else. So that's, it's not saying you have to be a devil worshiper. He doesn't need you to worship him. He just needs you to stop worshiping God because that would be a victory for him because that would be his achievement. That would be his achievement. Are you seeing how that adds up? Because then he would win. If I can get you anywhere, if I can get you on food, if I can get you on money, if I can get you on, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, if I can get you anywhere else, I win. I don't even need you to, you know, worship a poster of a devil with a little red whatever. It doesn't need to look like that. If I get your attention anywhere else, I win. Even when the devil tempts Jesus, and when the devil tempts Jesus, uh, maybe you've heard this, maybe not. If you haven't, God bless you, because I'm going to teach you some things right out the gate here. When the devil tempts Jesus, he offers him, hey, worship me, and I'll give you everything. But you know what else he offered him? Food. You know what else he offered him? Hey, uh, you can throw yourself down. Take care of yourself. Meet your own needs. It wasn't all about, hey, worship the devil. It was just take care of your own stuff. Take care of your own needs. Meet your own needs. Because as soon as I can get your eyes off of God meeting your needs, I win. Mm, that's big. I don't know if you got it, but that's big because that's where so many of us live. Meeting our own needs, taking care of our own stuff. I'm not saying you're a devil worshiper if you do that. I'm saying just, just recognize that's what the devil's been trying to do with all of humanity, trying to get our eyes off of him. He wants your attention off God. That's his goal. Now watch this. This is so cool. We're only just getting started, everybody. I haven't even got to the fun stuff yet. Check this out. Isaiah 14, 11. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. What? What? So here comes the devil with a harp? No. No, 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 no. Uh, many, um, many scholars believe that in his being was, was, like, was a stringed instrument. It was like, it, I've seen pictures of it where they try to make a picture of what it looks like. It's like a strings on his arm, in his arm, connected to him. It's like part of his being. There's no way to know because that's not how it works. But that's kind of what it, your stringed instruments were thrown down. No, again, I mean, remember that, that because we're coming back to this. This is a very important thing, that he had strings in his body. And he was cast down with those stringed instruments. More description about Lucifer right here. Ezekiel 28 this time. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. And, and notice this, write this down, underline it, whatever. Every precious stone adorned you. And I'm going to try to pronounce these. Carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Nailed it. Got it. Okay, I was really worried about that. Those are, some of those are kind of hard for me because I went to Bible college, but reading's hard. Your stringed instruments and stones. Put this in your frontal lobe. Okay, I want you to remember this short term. Remember this because this is going to add up. This is going to resolve that he had stringed instruments and he was covered with stones, beautiful stones. This is coming. We're coming back to this. And then it goes, um, your settings and your mountings were made of gold. Now, um, he says, settings and mountings made with gold, made with gold on the day you were created. They were prepared in the King James Version. It says your pipes and timbrels. 
your pipes and timbrels, which is, uh, your pipes is like, woo, like wind. And then timbrels, psh, like when Amanda was up here, psh. So you're, you got the precious stones all over you. You got strings up on you. And you got wind. And you got percussion on you. Um, so you've got strings, wind, and, and percussion. Now, I've been a musician my whole life. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, some of you are kind of newish around here. I used to play drums every single weekend here, and then I used to lead worship for a little while, but I've been around music my entire life. And if you've ever been to a symphony or anything like that, you know that music is categorized in three different spots. You know what they are? Strings, wind, and percussion. Those are the three categories of music, and they were built into Lucifer's being. This should show us that his function, his original created function was to give that praise, that glory to God. Music was created in Lucifer. It was created in Lucifer. I believe that. I believe it was created in him, and its purest form was to function as blessing God. Blessing God, praising God, giving him all the glory, all the praise. And watch this. It goes on to say this in verse 14. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. Anointed, when you anoint something, that means power is added to it. There's there's power there. If you're, oh, someone says, like someone really holy, you know, when you hear them talk and they're like, oh, they're so anointed. They're so anointed. You're like, what does that mean? Man, it just means that there's power. That there's God-given power there. So God gave special power and anointing to music. To music. I don't have to explain to you guys how powerful music is. How powerful it can be. You can have the most stone-cold killer and you play the right song, he's weeping. Because music has power. It affects us, doesn't it? It affects us. It has power in it. So I just want a, a little side note. Let the Holy Spirit lead you how that power is affecting you. Because that's good power and bad power both. And not just back then, it's here and now. That that power is still in effect and it could be used for evil and it could be used for good. Now, I'm not gonna sit up here and bash the music you're listening to. I just want you to be aware that music has power and you already know this. So we can either be giving glory to God with that or we can be hurting ourselves in a way because I'm... I'm going to out myself. This is not in my notes, and I shouldn't even bring this up, but I will, because I don't care. (laughs) I just am going to go for it. I'm a heavy metal guy. I was heavy metal from the day I was born. I was born with a double kick pedal. I I would do all of that. That was my flow. That was my jam. That's my drum set right there, and it has seen some action. It has seen some action. But when I got saved and I was, like, still listening to that same old stuff, I would start to notice even more getting out of my car like, like, like a murderer, like, uh, like I didn't, like, it didn't do it, but it, it affected me. And I began to notice because I was coming over here, lead me to the cross, and I'm like feeling good, everything's good, and then I get in my car, and it was like, I'm just saying to you, and there came a point in my life where I had to be more selective. That's all. I had to be more selective and, and, and choose because I, I know that there's a spirit behind that music. I've gone on too long about that. Let the Holy Spirit guide you in that anointing power that comes with music. Uh, let me circle back to this scripture here. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created, that's a, I can only highlight so many words, but that's important too. He was created. Lucifer was created. He was not in the beginning with God. He was created by God until wickedness was found in you. Uh, Though your widespread trade filled with violence and you sin. The trade is God. uh, Lucifer is trying to trade worship for God for worship for anything else. Worship of self, worship of ego, pride, money, prestige, power, lust, whatever it is. He's trying to trade our worship for God for something else. And then this is what he said. I drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub. Cherub just means angel. From among the fiery stones, your heart became proud. There it is again, pride. On the account of your beauty, because he was adorned with all those stones. And you, you're corrupted, your wisdom, because of your splendor, all that music that was just emanating out of you. So I threw you to the earth. There it is. The earth was formless, void, empty, dark. Darkness covered everything. I made a spectacle of you before kings. And Jesus said this, all of this I just said in like 20 minutes. Jesus said it like this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. 
<laughs> he got it done so much faster. Jesus was a better preacher than me because he could just communicate it a lot better. Now, Jesus is not created. He was in the beginning with God. He is God, was in the beginning with God. And so Jesus said, I saw him. And it wasn't like, I, I, this was in my, my life group, which is still going, by the way. We were in the life group this last Wednesday, and um, someone said in there, they were like, preaching off my notes. It was crazy. But it's like some people imagine that it's like Darth Vader versus Luke Skywalker, and they got, they got lightsabers, and they're like, good and evil are fighting, and then like good barely wins. It's not like that. It's not like that. There is one winning team, and it has always been one winning team. God wins. He's creator. Everything else is created. So when Satan sinned, bam, gone, done. Battle's over. There is no battle in that sense. The only battle that really occurs is inside you. Is inside you. Who are you going to partner up with? The only battle left, because God won. The grave has been conquered. Death has been conquered. The only battle left is, 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 is in here. And doesn't it exist there? Where am I going to give my allegiance? Where am I going to give my attention? Am I going to satisfy self? Am I going to satisfy my needs, my desires, my hopes? Or am I going to put first place King Jesus? <sighs> There's no fight. God wins. And the only fight occurs inside of us. So think, God has a vacancy in heaven now. This is where we're going to start to have some fun. God has a vacancy. He fired his worship leader on account of his pride. That's, that's one way to picture it, okay? Oh, you're prideful? He's like up here doing the thing. Like imagine heaven's like a, like a, like he's like singing his guitar. And he's like, oh, prideful? Gone, done, fired. So now there's a vacancy. I got my prayer angel over here. I got my word angel over here. But I got a, I got a vacancy in worship. I got a vacancy in worship. He has an open seat for employment. So the question of the day is this. Who is the new worship leader? Come on, somebody. Who is the new worship leader? Write this in. Who is the new worship leader? You already know. It's you. It's you. But I'm going to show you in a way you've never seen before, I bet. I'm going to show you how God made you to be a worshiper, that he made you for worship. The only real job is, that we have is to direct that worship the right way. The title of today's message is You Were Made for Worship. You were made for created, not created, excuse me, I'm going to get into that in a second. You were made for worship. Everything Lucifer was created with, you have. Everything Lucifer was created with, you have. I'll show it to you. This is so much fun. Strings, all the strings that were in his body, what do you call these? Vocal cords. All the, the wind, the wind instrument. That <sighs> joyful noise right there, huh? And what do Psalms tell us to do over and over again? Clap your hands, oh you people. This is called percussion. All of that stuff we're, we're coached to do through the Bible. And you're, if you're like me, you'd wonder why. Why am I supposed to clap my hands? Because Lucifer was created that way, and then he made us say, I don't need that joker. I'm going to populate the whole earth with my children who can do all of that themselves. This is big. This is big. You are the replacement for the unemployed angel Lucifer. And you are better. You are better. You are, are you mind blown yet? I mean, are you as excited about this as I am? I am fired up about this. What does this mean for us? There's three truths I'm going to leave you with. Three truths that this is what this means. Number one is this. God made me from him. This is so important. This is so important. This might be new information to some, but God made you from him. The creation account goes something like this, that he created some things and he made some things. Maybe you've never noticed the distinction before. He created some things. He said, let there be this, let there be that. But then he also said, let this produce that. And let this other thing produce that other thing. Have you ever noticed that in the creation account? Read Genesis, the first couple chapters. It'll take you moments, and you'll see it. You'll see it yourself. So let me, let me put it this way. Um, you take a pile of clay, and you, you make it into a vase. You didn't create the vase you made the vase from the clay that was already created. So I know this is a technicality, but you and I have never created anything. We make things out of other things. And so I, I'm the kind of person who would be annoyed if someone told me that. and be like, come on, dude, it's the same thing, whatever. But right now it matters. Right now it matters, and it actually will matter a whole lot more right now. Genesis 1.11 then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and seeds on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. He didn't say, let there be trees. He said it about other things, but he said, let there be trees. Why? 
Because for everything God made instead of created, he wanted there to be a relationship between everything that was made from that which it was made from. Think about it. The, the earth produces the tree, sustains the tree, and then the tree returns to the dirt when it's dead. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I, I was made from the dirt. Your body was, but not your spirit. Not the part that makes you, you. That was made from God. You know what he said? You know, because everything has that, everything has that connection, everything that was made. So like a, a tree and a seed, there's a connection between a father and a son, between you and God. This is what he said, Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Look, because they're going to be made from us. They're going to be sustained by us. And we're going to return back to him. Back to God. That's how he designed us to be sustained by him. Created, not created, made from, he didn't say let there be man. Because then it would just be from nothing. No, you notice this term our. Maybe you have questions about this. Our, who's he talking about? Is he talking about Lucifer? Is he talking about angels? No. I'm going to explain to you in the next series we do, get excited for this, that God even, so there's three characteristics of, of music. There's three named angels. There's something about the number three because even God describes himself in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is very godly. This is very good to understand. And the next series, we're going to go into what that looks like. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Father God are all one, but also operate differently, separately. Jesus wasn't faking when he was praying to the Father. Some people think that. Can you believe it? They do. Some people think that. They're taught that. And they think that Jesus was just pretending for our benefit. No, 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 no. There's really a Father. There's really a Son. There's really a Holy Spirit. And they're really one God. It's amazing, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Um, now, God didn't say, let there be man. He, he, said, he said, let's make him in our image. We are made from him, sustained by him, and we will return to him. The next truth goes like this. God made me to be with him. So we're made from him, but we're also, we're also made to be with him, be sustained by him. So we came from him, we're sustained by him, and we're designed for closeness and intimacy with God. We're made for it, okay? We can't truly spiritually survive without the connection. Not simply church attendance, not simply giving and serving. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. Listen to this in Ephesians 5. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. One with God. We live together every single day, taking all the time to talk about all the issues. It's the most purest form of marriage we could ever have is that connection with God every day, constantly, all the time. But this marriage is even, even better than the one you have. Sorry, you, you newlyweds. You know, you think it's the best ever. I get it. But our relationship with God is supposed to be even better than that. Look at uh, Revelation 21. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. We are, we are his bride. We are his bride. Some of you might say amen, and some of you men might go, Oh, that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't want to be nobody's bride. That's weird. It's imagery. Okay, it's imagery. You're not his wife in that sense, okay? It's just a picture of what that unity, that intimacy, that closeness is supposed to be like. All right, boys, so chill, all right? It's not like that. It's not like that. And this is, and this is, what, this is what goes on to say in, in still in Revelation 21. The foundation of the city walls of heaven where we're going, the foundation of the city walls where we're going, were decorated with every precious stone. Remember the stones? All those same stones that Lucifer had are waiting for us. That, that's going to be, the glory that was given to him has been transferred and given to us. It's, it's just, it blows my mind. And I, I'm sure I don't understand it fully, but it's so amazing to me that there's so much in the Bible that, that shows us how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, and how we're made to do this worship thing differently than we imagine, differently than just, oh, yeah, praise, uh-huh, sacrifice of praise, yeah, in my car, whatever. No, it's so much bigger than that. 
Just like having all the instruments built into us, all those precious stones are waiting for us. He's giving it all to us. The first foundation is jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, agate. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, onyx. The sixth, ruby. Chrysolite. Beryl. Topaz. Turquoise. Uh, jacket? I don't know what some of these are, man. I'm just telling you. There is so many. You know what it looks like to me? It looks like an obsessed husband buying the whole jewelry store. <laughs> That's what it makes me think of. Like a husband will normally get like his wife a little, a little thing. Oh, here you go. Oh, it's you. <laughs> Did you like some? And then God's like, I'm buying it all. The streets are made with gold. And the walls of your house is going to be this one and that one and this one and that. All of that's yours. All of it's yours. The jewelry. So he bought out the whole thing. Number three is this, this last truth. God made me to express love to him. We're created from him, sustained by him. And now we express love to him. That's what worship really is. Expressing love to him. From him, with him, to him. All he wants is for you to love him back to be excited about loving him back. Kind of the same way that he loves you. He's excited about loving you. Everyone loves hearing about that. But God's like, would you reciprocate this love? This love I have for you, reciprocate it? How beautiful, though, how simple. This is what it is. This is what our relationship with God is supposed to be like, us loving each other, God loving us, us loving him. What he wants for you is to reciprocate the love that he freely gives. John 4, 23 says this. Yet a time is coming and it's now come when true worshipers will worship, everyone say worship, the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Now this word worship, I'm going to finish with this. This is profound and this is, I'm, I'm sure not very many people know about this and I was mind blown when I learned it myself. And it's, it's, it's big, I, I hope it impacts you so much. The, this word worship is man-made. It's a man-made word, worship. It's translated from Greek. The, the New Testament is translated into Greek or from Greek. And then the Old Testament, um, Aramaic and Hebrew, mostly Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. But it's a Greek word, proskuneo. Proskuneo. Is it up there? Oh, yeah. Look at how weird it is. That's Greek. All right? That's Greek. Don't reveal it to him until I'm ready to reveal it, my man, because this is going to be a reveal moment. Because this word, what it really means, is going to shock you. I don't even think some of you are going to like it. You're not going to like it. You're going you're to wish it was something different. But this word, proskuneo, because people think, you know, you sit there and you go, oh, yeah, my worship right here. I'm going to be right here. I'm just going to, mm -hmm, my sacrifice of praise. And, and hold the TV. <laughs> Caught a fish that was this big. I'm in my car. Lead me to the cross. <laughs> like, we, we think worship is that. And worship is an English word that means worth-ship, expressing worth, which checks out. But it's, it's bigger. It's bigger than that. I think it's going to shock you. Are you ready? It's, it's a verb. It's an action word. So this is an action word to do something. You're not going to like it. Are you, you want to see it? You want to see what it means? I don't know. I don't know if you guys are ready. Are you, re are you ready to hear it? It means... I, knew, I told you, I told you some of you were going to be like, oh, hold on now. No, this is not the, this is not romantic. This is not sexual. This is not that, kind, not the kind of kiss of lovers. What the actual translation, the Greek word, proskuneo, meaning to kiss, is actually like the kiss of like a dog licking the, its master's hand. Just like, ah, oh, oh. have you ever owned a dog? Has anyone here ever owned a dog? I, I owned a dog once. Her name was Lucy. And whenever I came home from work or wherever I was, I wouldn't even get inside my front gate. <laughs> jumping on the door, jumping on, have you ever owned a dog? Dogs are like this, and they, I get closer to the door and I start to jiggle the handle, her little legs, she's a little pit bull like this big, so excited, Just scratching on the door, so excited, I open the door, like running circles, run around in circles around the living room and then come back and do it again. Ah, oh, oh, I'm just so excited to see you. Oh my God, I can't believe you're home. Oh, I'm so excited. Yes. Oh, I've been waiting for you all day. That kind of love, that kind of affection, that's worship. That's what worship means. That's the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
true worshipers will be, oh God, I can't, be, oh, Sunday again? Oh, I'm gonna beat you to the front row. I'm gonna beat you to the front row. Oh, I'm gonna take more notes than you. Oh, here we go. Oh yeah, pra- yeah, lead me to the crowd. Oh yeah. If you've never owned a dog, you, you, you ought to try it one day. They love you. They love you like no human being can. You know, you, if you want to see it in real life, you know, just put your wife in the trunk and a dog in a trunk and see which one's happy to see you after a few minutes. <laughs> Guaranteed it's not your wife. Your dog, I'm just, I'm just saying, there's a reason it was written like this. We're supposed to be excited. Now, don't get it. No, come on now. Stay with me. Men, hang in there. That, that excitement, you know, that passion, that energy, we're so reserved in our culture. We're so afraid to let anybody see any kind of emotion or, or energy. But the word tells us over and over again, man, clap your hands, lift your hands, give a shout of praise. You know, praise him, come to, come to God for he has saved us. He's saved you. He's, he's made you new. He's, he's given you a fresh start. All these things are supposed to be, oh yeah, awesome. You know, we look down at, churches that are too, oh, you know, they're just, it's a big show over there, but you know what? At least they got something right. They got energy for it, man. They're, they're, they're worshipers. I, so this worship series, I, I would love for you to open your, your heart and your mind up to go, you know what? That's, that's the kind of worshiper I want to be, and, and just appreciate, maybe I'm not there. Maybe I'm not there. Maybe I'm not ready to, to but, but God, I want to be, because I am grateful. I am thankful. It feels good to be loved that much based on what we learned, I think God's no different. He wants us to be just as excited as our puppy would be, <laughs> at least, that, that we would see him and that all that he's done for us, thanking him with our first breath in the morning, giving our best, doing all the things, you know, but it's, it's from a place of, God, I just love you so much. It's worship. Ladies and gentlemen, that is proskuneo worship. That's worship. I want to give you an opportunity right here now to, to just surrender your heart. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe it's been never. But if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I want to, I want to take this opportunity to just let God in in a fresh way, a new way, that maybe we would begin to see how excited we ought to be for the Lord and how much he's done for us. Father, in Jesus' name, Thank you so much for every person here, and I pray right now that all our hearts would be open to receive and really see how good you are and how much you deserve our praise, how much you deserve our worship. I pray anyone here that needs to experience your love, to know your love, and to make you king in their life would do so right now. If that's you and you want to make him king and you want to just surrender yourself to him, would you just lift your hand up? Say, that's me. I want, I want this kind of love in my life. Amen. I see you. Hallelujah. Amen. I see you. Come on. This is your chance. Be bo- Amen. Amen. God wants to fill you up to overflowing to the place where you are. Just run into him. Run into him. Church, let's pray this prayer. Let everyone say it with me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. Thank you for sending your son Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin. Make me new. Fill me with your spirit. And show me the life that is truly life. Amen.